can turn to anti-racist action, which was organized in the late 80s by uh, anti-racist skinheads from Minneapolis uh, who were trying to fight back against a white power incursion into their skinhead scene. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Maine to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. We begin with some creative protest for Ahed Tamimi and the Palestinian women prisoners. A flash mob in Washington's Union Station. Not another nickel! Not another time! No more money for Israel's crimes! Not another nickel! Not another time! No more money for Israel's crimes! So we're here today for 16-year-old Palestinian activist Ahed Tamimi. Israel says that Ahed Tamimi is a criminal because when a soldier came and tried to invade her home, she slapped the soldier in the face with her bare hand. But yesterday, every day these soldiers enter her land and her property, they allow settlers to steal their resources, they shoot her family, and on this day I had stood up and she said no more. This follows a rally for the Tamimis in Grand Central Station, New York City. And guerrilla posters starting in London, appearing in many places, even Venice, Italy. A tweet of support from actor John Cusack and selfies with slogans. And then there's a campaign that asks you to write letters to Ahed Tamimi. Here's the address. Now a segue to the women's marches on January 20th. We suggest that one of the demands concern the Tamimi women and the general oppression of Palestinian women by the race supremacists in Israel. This week, Democracy Now! had a one-hour interview with Norman Finkelstein, activist and scholar. Finkelstein is the son of Holocaust survivors and perhaps for that very reason, a pitiless critic of Israeli occupation and atrocities. In return, Zionists have destroyed his academic career. Amy Goodman asked him about the corruption scandals that Netanyahu appears involved with, and Finkelstein replied with a scathing critique of Israeli society. Uh, but the question you asked about the corruption in general, it's an interesting question. Uh, you're not quite as old as me, but you can go back far enough to remember that when we were growing up, uh, Israel was a very austere, it was a simple, and it was a pretty honest place. And that's the image of Israel that retains in the minds of many American Jews, say, over the age of, uh, over the age of 50. And so, Back then, let's say you take in the 1970s, um, ben, um, Yitzhak Rabin, who was the prime minister, he had to leave office. He was forced out of office because his wife had opened up a bank account, one bank account in the United States, and apparently there wasn't even any money deposited, in it, if my memory is correct. But nowadays, it's just one scandal after another scandal after another scandal after another scandal. And the remarkable thing is, it doesn't really affect Benjamin Netanyahu's standing. You can have a succession of scandals, but he has been in office for a remarkably long period of time. And then the question is, why? And I think the answer is because whether one likes it or not, Benjamin Netanyahu is the true face of Israel. He's an obnoxious, loudmouth, racist, Jewish supremacist, and that's the whole population now. Now, I'm not saying it's in their DNA. I'm not saying it's genetic. But it is a very sorry thing that the state of Israel has 
degenerate into. And I mean, it's clearly not the entire population. Uh, well, you have so many critics. You have a peace no, movement there. I, I would you, say, you know, Amy, I would wish that were the case. I would wish that were the case. But if you ask the critics themselves, if you ask a Gideon Levy, you ask an Amir Ahas, you who ask for Bet, right, you ask Beth Selim, you ask the human break, rights group, right, breaking the silence, the soldiers group, they'll tell you they represent nobody. They'll tell you they don't represent anymore. There was a period where they represented at least a, a factor in Israeli life, but it's no longer true. And the fact that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu endures despite the succession of scandals is, is uh, an, a manifestation of how much that society has degenerated. So uh, Gideon Levy, I think, the columnist, he made a comment the other day, which I found very interesting. He said, the Israelis, they see a fellow in a wheelchair. He lost both his legs in Gaza. He's holding a flag. They shoot him right between the eyes, a sharpshooter. Everybody sees it on video. He says, no Israelis cared. Then another kid is killed. In this case, the second case, a kid is killed. A third is killed. Nobody cares. One thing they care about, the young girl, Ahed Tamimi, smacked an Israeli soldier. That causes hysteria. Our guest today, author and scholar Norman Finkelstein, author of the new book, Gaza, An Inquest into Its Martyrdom. The book published as Israel's Facing a Possible International Criminal Court War Crimes Probe over its 2014 assault on Gaza, which killed more than 2,100 Palestinians, including over 500 children. I want to turn to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, talking about the 2014 military offensive in Gaza. He was speaking to Brian Williams of NBC News. You know, at a certain point, you say, what choice have you got? What would you do? What would you do if American cities, where are you sitting now, Brian, would be rocketed, would absorb hundreds of rockets? Uh, you, know, you know what would you, you'd say? You'd say to your leader, a man's got to do what a man's got to do, and you'd say a country's got to do what a country's got to do. We have to defend ourselves. We try to do it with the minimum uh, amount of uh, force or uh, with targeting uh, military uh, targets as best as we can, but we'll act to defend ourselves. No country can live like this. That was Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu justifying the 2014 military offensive in Gaza, that the International Criminal Court is apparently um, about to in, uh, in open up a war crimes investigation into. Well, um, Benjamin Netanyahu says two things. Number one, Israel had no option and number two, that it used the minimum amount of force. Well, let's look quickly at those two points. Point number one, everybody agreed that the reason they went, once the fighting began, Hamas had one goal. The goal was to end the siege of Gaza, to lift the siege. Under international law, that siege is illegal. It constitutes collective punishment which is illegal under international law. The siege has been condemned by everybody in the international community. He had an option. He didn't have to use force. He simply had to lift the siege. And then there wouldn't have been a conflict with Gaza. Number two, he claims he used minimum force. There's a lot to say about that. You can decide for yourself whether it's minimum force when Israel leveled 18,000 homes, how many Israeli homes were leveled? One. Israel killed 550 children. How many Israeli children were killed? One. Now, you might say, well, that's because Israel has a sophisticated civil defense system or Israel has Iron Dome. I won't go into that. I don't have time now. But there's a simple test. The test is, what did the Israeli combatants themselves see? What did they themselves say? We have the documentation, a report put out by the Israeli ex-service, uh, ex-combatant organization, Breaking the Silence. It's about 110 pages. You couldn't believe it. You know, I'll tell you, Amy, I still remember when I was reading it. I was in Turkey. I was going to a book festival. I was sitting in the back of a car.
and reading these descriptions of what the soldiers did. My skin was crawling. I was like shaking. Soldier after soldier after soldier. Now bear in mind, you want to say they're partisan, the soldiers? Read the testimonies. They're not contrite. They're not remorseful. They're just describing what happened. There's no contrition. These aren't lefties, supporters of BDS. What do they describe? One after another after another says, our orders were shoot to kill anything that moves and anything that doesn't move. One after another after another says, Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza. Israel used lunatic amounts of firepower in Gaza. These were the Israeli soldiers. The soldiers, they're describing it. One after another says, we blew up, destroyed, systematically, methodically raised every house in sight. What does that mean, every house in sight? 70% of the people in Gaza, they're refugees. It means they lost their homeland. The last thing they have, the only thing they have, the only thing they've ever had is their home. And the Israelis went in like a wrecking crew with their D9 bulldozers. Explain how it began. How what? How the 2014 Israeli military invasion of you know, Gaza These began. are hard things to explain because it depends on where you want to start. Where I start is at the end of April 2014, a national unity government was formed between, Israel, between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. And the United States and the EU, surprisingly, they didn't break off negotiations with this new unity government, although it included a um, terrorist organization. And it enraged— Netanyahu. You're using air quotes. You're saying what the U.S. called a terrorist well, what organization. What Israel calls a terrorist organization, because at that time the U.S. was willing to negotiate. Uh, and Netanyahu went into a rage because he was being ignored over Iran. Now he's being ignored over Hamas. And so he finds a pretext. I don't want to go into the details now. He finds a pretext to try to provoke Hamas into reacting so that he can say, you see, they're a terrorist organization. And then it quickly uh, spiraled downwards, as it typically does. Uh, and then Israel went in. There was the uh, air assault. And then July 17th, the day the Malaysian airliner went down over the Ukraine, um, Netanyahu used that moment. The plane was down in the afternoon, and he allowed, launches the ground invasion in the evening. Uh, you'd be surprised how, how finely attuned the Israelis are to the American news cycle. They begin Operation Protective Edge in 2008 with uh, Obama's election to the presidency on November 4th. They begin the ground invasion of, of Gaza during, uh, well, 2004 was Operation Cast Lead. They begin Cast Lead in November 4th, 2008 when Obama's elected president, they begin Operation Protective Edge, then ground invasion, on July 17th, when the airliner uh, is downed over the Ukraine. All the cameras are now riveted over there. And so they launch the attack. Um, and the attack was, well, let me just quote to you Peter Moore, who was the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And I was even surprised by his remark. Peter Moore said, and I'm quoting him, paraphrasing him, but almost verbatim. He said, in my entire professional life, I have never seen destruction as I saw in Gaza. Now, that's coming from the, the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross, who is accustomed to seeing, witnessing war zones. Uh, what was done there was... Uh, it was a crime against humanity. You take a place like Shujaya. Shujaya, it's a very densely populated neighborhood of 90,000 people. Israel dropped, believe it or not, it's hard to even fathom, more than 100 one-ton bombs on Shujaya. More than 100 one-ton bombs on Shujaya. Did the same thing to Rafa, did the same thing to Kuza, did the same thing to the whole Gaza Strip. 
And then you have this guy come along and he said, we use discriminate force. We used proportionate force. I wanted to go to, after the an attack on a U.N. shelter in 2014, the Israeli military attacking in Gaza, which killed many Palestinian civilians, the spokesperson for UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency mm -hmm. for Palestine Refugees, broke down and cried during an interview in Al Jazeera. His name is Christopher Gunness. The rights of Palestinians, even their children, are wholesale denied, and it's appalling. <clears throat> Christopher Gunness is starting to cry. My pleasure. <laughs> That's Christopher Gunness as the camera turns away from him, his head in his hands, later tweeting, there are times when tears speak more eloquently than words, mine pale into insignificance compared with Gaza's. What do you think needs to be done now? Well, it's clear the first thing that has to be done is the siege has to be lifted. And the U.N. Human Rights Council, although its report was a total and complete whitewash and disgrace, uh, Mary McGowan Davis was the author of it, they did say, according to the law, the siege has to be list lifted immediately and unconditionally. That's the law. It has to be li lifted immediately and unconditionally. That's the first thing that has to be done. The siege has to end, the occupation has to end, and the people of Gaza, after 50 godforsaken years, should have the right to breathe and live a normal life. We turn to Syria. This is what passes for good news. The white helmets rescue a buried child. <laughs> On January 6th and 7th, there were protests in a number of cities in solidarity with Syria. They were included in them important acts of sympathy for struggles in Iran. I've stood with the Syrian revolution and the Syrian people from the beginning. Uh, I will be with Free Syria now, and I will be with Free Syria forever. Right on, brother. Right. 
And now the conclusion of Mark Bray's talk about his book Antifa, a report on the movement that takes direct action against Nazis and fascists. Bray spoke several months ago at Wesleyan University. The issue, of course, is still relevant. The Connecticut IWW reports that on the 29th of December, some 15 people gathered in front of a statue of Christopher Columbus in Hartford, Connecticut for a white power rally. So once again, as I, I clarified in the outset, if we think of anti-fascism broadly, um, then the peoples of the Americas are no strangers to fighting back against white supremacy. And it's important to kind of provincialize this specific historical tradition within the larger legacy. We can think of anti-fascism in terms of clan resistance, the Black Panthers organized against what they considered to be fascist pigs taking over their neighborhoods. So you can think of it broadly, but if we want to focus on the specific legacy of this militant anti-fascist tradition in North America, we can turn to anti-racist action, which was organized in the late 80s by uh, anti-racist skinheads from Minneapolis uh, who were trying to fight back against a white power incursion into their skinhead scene. By the mid-90s, it had hundreds of chapters, thousands of members across the US, Canada, and a little in Latin America. And um, they did a, a wide variety of, of, of activities. Here we have an image from their first newsletter back in, I imagine, probably 88 or so. And here you can sort of see how they laid out some kind of basic action-oriented tasks. By the 90s, however, their, their sort of points of unity broadened. They had four points of unity. We go where they go, which was essentially an argument for having an oppositional voice whenever the far right mobilizes. Non-sectarian uh, protection of all anti-fascists. So once again, militant anti-fascism is about looking beyond political divides to work together. Um, we don't turn to the police or the state or the courts to stop the far right. Then there was a little clause saying, sometimes we go to court, but that's not the solution to the problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because so, you know, sometimes there will be cases where they have to defend themselves, but anyway, it's a militant anti-fascist tradition. And the last one was defense of reproductive rights. So you can see that even in this case, anti-racist action had a broad understanding and they organized against what they considered to be Christian fascists who targeted abortion clinics and reproductive rights and so forth. They also would sometimes go into schools to speak to young people, did popular education, and had a wide variety of activities, Palestine solidarity campaigns in some cases. So. The anti-racist action network kind of peaked in the 90s into the early 2000s. It declined by the late 2000s, and that's when you see sort of the kind of organizing wave that has led to the current Antifa movement today. Um, the oldest currently existing group is Rose City Antifa in Portland, Oregon, created in 2007. And there you see the start of the use of the Antifa label and aesthetics and symbols. So recently I was looking through all these old anti-racist action newspapers and newsletters from the 90s. What was conspicuously ac absent in just about all of them were these flags and these arrows. Nowhere to be found, right? So it's a more of a recent European symbolism that has brought these things over over the last decade. And that's also um, true to some extent in the British case because in the 80s and 90s, the British image was the red triangle from the Holocaust, sort of reclaiming a socialist uh, anti-fascism through that symbol. And these are more of German origin, though the arrows were used by European socialist parties. Anyway, I'm really into symbols. Discard that if you're not interested. I'm going to say a few more things, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Um, so in understanding what anti-fascism is and means, I came upon a cheesy metaphor that, despite being cheesy, I think is useful. I think to some extent we can think of anti-fascism as an accordion that can be expanded or contracted depending on what note you're trying to play. What I mean by that is, when I try to explain what I mean by that, I think of a conversation I had with a Madrid anti-fascist named Daniel, and he explained that in his perspective, there are two faces of anti-fascism. And he said it's important that we never forget either face. The first face is that which tries to short circuit the organizing of the far right, prevent them from holding demonstrations, from embedding themselves in communities, disseminating their message, the other face is that which tries to inoculate society against the messages of the far right. So that when there's an economic depression, 
people turn to their coworkers and neighbors rather than blaming immigrants. So that basically anti-fascism doesn't have to be a specialty activity, it's common sense. We don't let that happen in our community, neighborhood, world. Um, so in that way, I think if you look at the anti-fascist neighborhood assemblies organized in Spain and France, where they uh, frequently are organized by anti-fascist militants who have their own affinity groups, but also include unionists and community organizers and residents, and ways that sort of the, the bridge between mass mobilization and uh, political militancy are bridged, then I think that you can, you can see anti-fascism not just as stopping the far right, but as police abolition work, as anti-gentrification work, thinking about all these intersections, it can be sort of a broad or a narrow framework depending on how you see it. So in that sense, I think the Italian slogan, siamo tutti anti-fascisti, that we're all anti-fascist is really important because we all have an investment in fighting back against this. I don't think that we can be neutral about white supremacy or fascism. So with that, I will open it up for questions and comments. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.